In a remote time, Spider Grandmother thought outward into space. She thought and breathed and sang and spun the world into existence. So threads and stories, spinning in spirals, all began with Spider Grandmother. To the Hopi, life is part of an infinite pattern, a continuum of cycles within cycles. The spinning of the planets reflects the cycle of the seasons, and the circular journey of human life mirrors this larger pattern. The Hopi believe they emerged from below into this world after three prior worlds had begun and ended. This is the story of their fourth world. Mankind, by their own corruption and greed, brought the world to a terrible mess in, in a world before this one. And uh, out of this grew some very sincere and honest men who sat down and meditated and eventually uh, by meditation sensed that there was another world which could be a better world and to which mankind could go for and be saved. And they called upon the world of nature, animals and birds. And each of the clans relate this part of the emergent story in their own way. And with the Eagle Clan, naturally, it was the eagle that flew into the sky, and then they would ask him what he could tell them about the world up there. And so when he landed, the eagle related that he had found life up there. And this is the Hopi story about the emergence. The Hopi look to nature for knowledge to gain a better world while the Western mind looks to science in the search for a new perspective on life. And I'm sure that Hopis, even though they are awed by technology and the things that it does, they're not necessarily surprised by it. And so when I watched that television program in 1969, it was a grand show when the men landed on the moon. 35 degrees. Roger, 1202, we copy it. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. Tranquility base here, the Eagle has landed. The Eagle has landed. That was the first thing he said. Certainly, any Hopi can recognize the cyclical nature of the landing on a moon in terms of finding a new life, a new future for mankind. And that's precisely what happened with the natural eagle when he came across to the fourth world and in that remote day. For more than a thousand years, the Hopi have survived without irrigation on this harsh, dry land. We have a commitment to raise the corn. We committed ourselves to live by that law, and the law is the corn. To the Hopi, the seasonal cycle of corn mirrors the human journey we all share a pattern made visible in their fields. <laughs> 
Today, 8 to 10,000 Hopi and their Tewa neighbors live in 12 independent villages perched high above their fields in northeastern Arizona. The Grand Canyon lies to the west, the New Mexico border to the east. Among these villages are the oldest continuously inhabited settlements on the North American continent. Since the Spanish discovered their villages in 1540, the Hopis have resisted religious conversion, but have chosen to use some new tools of technology. In the face of 400 years of European contact and pressure, they have kept their ancient agricultural practices and values. No piece of land belongs to any individual. And he gave us permission to use it and to take care of it. So that's why the Hopis don't like fences. Hopis say their people live at the center point of the world and that it is their destiny to be there. They say their space is sacred, multidimensional, a circle orbited by the emerging and descending sun. Hopi Yellow clouds, yellow butterflies, yellow corn, the good things of life for the people. It's always yellow. Hopi corn, that's one kind of Hopi blue. Blue corn, blue butterflies, and blue clouds, the kinds of blue that you see on Katsinas. The third direction is Tatkyak, red. The red corn, the red flowers, the red butterflies, the red clouds. And the fourth is white, which is Hopak. We happen to have in Hopi corn all of these colors. And these are the cardinal directions. They hope you, they go by the positions of the sun on the horizon. That very point there is the time for planting certain seeds. In the morning, I get up, you say, to watch the sun rises. I keep track of all this here, you know, when certain things happening. And I also put down the, up on the horizon, the line in here, the line up on the eastern horizon. I regard that as a record, you know, what has been done, you know, from day to day, from day to day. It teaches you how to observe and have your mind and heart on your field and watermelons and beans and corn, because that's 
where our roots is. We are rooted into our cornfields. The Hopi plant where the sandy soil protects moisture below and in the floodplains where the few inches of precious rain flowing from the mesas feed the plants. Farming here is an art, an act of faith. The working of the corn is a very sacred thing. Because there's no irrigation, it's conscious preservation of every drop of moisture in the ground. And so when a Hopi farmer comes to plant, he has to push this dry surface away. And eventually he gets down to the moist dirt. And then into this soft place, he puts the seed. The very sacredness of life is corn. And it is this sacredness which keeps the Hopi coming back out to his field, even though, looking at it strictly economically, it seems futile to see Hopis come out and do the work in the, in the way that they do it, when it could be done a lot more efficiently. The planting stick is a magical stick that carries with it all of this knowledge. <laughs> The corn, when it's placed in Mother Earth, in its womb, is born by emerging out of the ground. And it is treated as a newborn with all the loving care and all of the right attitude and cheerfulness that the person is capable of bringing. I mean, you know, you think that talking to plants was some new idea. The Hopis have always done it. <laughs> As the corn grows, one farmer must be singing. It doesn't make any special song, but there must be music along with the growth of the corn. We emerged in this world the same way as the corn emerges. After a while, it gets to the point where the leaves, out of their weight, fall back to the ground as though for support. We lean on Mother Earth for support. On the wings of the wind, the male tassels scatter the pollen. The corn silk catches the pollen to fertilize the plant. Like young maidens, the plants are ready to bear. The girls, they used to go out to the edge of the village after the dance, you know, in the evening. So the girls all sit down in a row, and then when the boys come, they stand behind them, and then they sing songs like serenading them, and they're not allowed to visit with each other any time of the day. The only time they can visit is at night when the girls grind corn. latch and the mother sees that no one comes in. They have the little hole where they can talk to each other and that's the only way they can visit. If a boy is whispering from outside and the girl doesn't want to talk to him, she doesn't stop grinding. 
She usually knows when the right one comes, you know. <laughs> and she might stop grinding and talk to him. And of course, um, the first time the mother knows that she isn't grinding, she gets up and goes and investigates and asks her who is the boy. And she'll tell him, and if she doesn't approve, then she said not to talk to him. If it's the boy that she approves of, she lets her visit with him. <laughs> My mother took me to my husband's, you know, parents' house, and I uh, stayed there, and I had to grind corn for three days straight, you know. There's a lot of women that help the bride prepare the cornmeal for the feast. And it's hard work. And a lot of ladies and men would come to the feast. The corn is stacked and stored until needed. Then the moist blue corn is ground and mounded in bowls, pottery jars, and metal tubs. Many Hopi foods are made with blue cornmeal, but piki is special to Hopi. It is a paper-thin bread that Hopis have eaten for a thousand years. When you make piki, you have the blue cornmeal and the ashes, but just put a little bit on it, and that will color the whole batter. This is our bread. When I put my first touch on the stone, it's hot. Yeah, fingers had to get used to it. Making piki is a part of daily life as well as a necessary preparation for a birth, a wedding, or a ceremonial. Women make vast stacks of piki for the wedding feast. <laughs> Wedding preparations continue as the groom's father or clan uncles weave the bridal robes and the bride's mother and family make a special basket for the groom. Ayo 
In her arms, the bride holds the wedding sash. On each side, corn tassels and fringes are symbols of rain and growth. The red dots above the tassel at the base of her gown symbolize the months of blood that nourish the embryo. The red rings and threads encircling the tassels are the veins in the uterus that feed the child. The eagle feathers are a joyful prayer for the child's life on this earth. Here at the lip of conception, the bride wears her shroud, for the bridal robe is her winding cloth, just as the basket her mother makes for the groom will sail him into the clouds at his death. A bride. Like the corn stalk, she carries the capacity for bearing children. She carries the future. The corn plant is like the human body, a body in which life resides. The ears are the children of the stalk, just like children are offspring of men and women. Mother corn is a perfect ear of corn, which survives the profane world of insects and bugs and crows and turns up with kernels all the way to its end. This corn plays a significant role as the mother as you go from one phase of life to the next phase. When a child is born, it is cared for by its mother and aunts in a darkened room for 20 days. At dawn, the child, protected by a perfect ear of mother corn, is presented to the sun in its naming ceremony. A pinch of fine white cornmeal is put into the baby's mouth. And they say, this is what we eat on this earth. And so you eat that till you have come to the earth to eat this kind of food. That's what they tell the baby. May you live free <laughs> from pain, and may you live long and go to sleep from old age. The Hopi believe that when they die, their last breath, their spirit, becomes a cloud, and the clouds that bring the rain are powerful spirit forces called kachinas. Kachinas become clouds. They travel. They have this power to make life. And so the Hopis look to the kachinas for this life blood called rain. Kachinas are the forces of life-giving nature. From winter to the summer solstice, the Kachinas come from their mountain homes to the plazas to dance. Kachinas help the people prepare for the time of planting, a preparation that takes place first in the hearts and minds of the people. Be faithful, keep your thoughts happy, 
so that your crops will emerge straight and tall. For the Hopi, thoughts and prayers, wishes and feelings, all affect the balance of the world around them. As I paint the Gachino dances, I would hum the, the, that particular Gachina music, because that's, you are just involved with all that, you know, the, and you are pumped with that, and you can't help but sing very, maybe softly, as you, as you paint. I got started painting when I was at Santa Fe. And naturally, when you are away from your people, you think about your people. And when there's priests there, way up in the mountain, back of Santa Fe, you hear the home Gajina music among the trees. It, there's just music, you know. And it's the music that inspire you to start painting. The Kachinas, through their ceremonial songs, inspire life, here and in the hereafter. They are our future. They are already where we are preparing to go, by our faith. When we see the clouds forming, we know that they're coming. But we can't say it's our people that are coming. We say Kachinas are coming. Sacrifices come to fruition in rain, clouds, corn, growth, life. 